Welcome to Node Mode, the NFT podcast on digital art, where we talk with artists, collectors, and reasonably intelligent people about all things NFTs. As usual, nothing in this video is financial advice. We're not financial advisors, and the NFT space is risky, so always do your own research. I don't even know what to say today uh, in terms of the intro. I have been looking forward to this moment since the podcast began. Many of you know uh, my nickname is the uh, disciple of DC investors. So I am very excited to have DC on the show today uh, to help us learn and to think a little bit longer term. You know, lots of us like to think uh, in, in days and hours and weeks. And DC knows how to think in terms of years and decades. Uh, DC, welcome to the show. It is an honor to have you. Thanks for having me on, Node. Um, really appreciate uh, the invitation and also everything uh, you do engaging with the space. No, thank you. It's uh, it's it's it, it really is like I I wouldn't be here without without you. I I kind of I feel like I learned about your name like two and a half years ago through Bankless actually, and then mm. it was like forget Bankless. I'm just going straight to DC because <laughs> you were going into you know, uh, generative art right at that same time. And so it got super interesting, but I guess before we go any further, I should wish you a, uh, happy air, uh, Arbitrum airdrop day. How's that going for you? Have you even looked, have you even checked? No, I haven't, I haven't worked on all that yet. I usually just let things kind of work themselves out and, uh, I'm never in a rush to do these things, which I think is generally good advice when you're doing stuff on chain. I saw a lot of people like trying to do the claim kind of more quickly and yeah, I just, I, I just take my time with that stuff. Wise man. Yeah. My, I, you know, in all the discords that I'm in, it's like everybody's frustrated trying to set up their own RPC endpoint and trying to claim directly from contract and it's not working. Uh, and half the time, you know, you, you wait a couple of days and the price might even be a little bit better. So before we jump into the, I guess, since we're on the topic of Arbitrum, before I jump into the NFT side of things, mm -hmm. I, I'm really curious to get your take on you know, let's maybe we should just start off with Ethereum and give people a good base here, you know, of what we of what you think long term, because uh, many of us, in, if, if we if we follow you, uh, we know that you're a fan of, of Ethereum and mm -hmm. you are optimistic about how it's going to grow and scale in the future. Um, how does Arbitrum play into that? And how do you view kind of ETH and L2s, you know, uh, continuing to exist moving forward? Well, I think I don't think it's a surprise to most people who are probably watching this that I'm bullish on Ethereum and I'm bullish on Ether as well. And my thesis behind Ethereum just boils down to one, it was the first smart contract platform. I don't think being first is is the only reason why it's important, though. I think in a lot of ways, Ethereum probably launched at a pretty unique time um, versus kind of in more recent years when Ethereum launched. It was kind of before even the ICO mania. Some might even say it kind of started the ICO mania, but there there was an ICO where some tokens were sold. Um, but but it's kind of grown beyond that. And I think what's interesting is at the time when Ethereum launched, there weren't like a lot of like institutional investors and VCs piling into it trying to push a narrative. I'm not. There were a few kind of like semi-institutional investors, like you know Joseph Lubin, who went on to found Consensus, which has been kind of a supportive. Um, commercial organization focused on building on Ethereum. But I don't think that Ethereum really, Ethereum kind of more in its DNA, I think, had this concept of, hey, we want to be this decentralized, as neutral as possible base layer for this future kind of ownership internet, this internet of uh, assets. And I think that has kind of stuck with it. Ethereum has evolved a lot um, since I got involved with it and since it launched. Um, before, especially in the earlier days, it was really just kind of uh, prominent developers who were involved with it. Um, but then it, we went on and we had a lot more kind of community members jump into it as well. We had community members kind of get interested in the technology, which was kind of powering Ethereum and some of the applications that you could build on it. And that was always my hypothesis is that over time, you know, it wasn't just going to be this niche thing for developers. It was really going to pull in users and a community. Um, so I think Ethereum has done quite a bit of that really since 2016, when kind of more mainstream users like myself started coming in. Fast forward to today, and we now see Ethereum scaling into something which is a lot bigger than um, a lot of people ever thought it would be, quite frankly. You know, I mean, there's a lot of discussion when Ethereum launched around being this world computer. What does that really mean? Um, the reality is that Ethereum layer one by itself um, probably is not going to achieve the scale that we want to see from decentralized applications more broadly. 
um, if we're really talking about onboarding millions of users um, who are entrusting their financial assets to the platform, um, we need ways to use Ethereum, which go beyond kind of the layer one blockchain. And that's where I think layer twos kind of slot really nicely into that, um, including Arbitrum and, and many others which are emerging with various technological experiments. And, and by the way, I, I don't want this to be a total monologue here, but I just want to share a couple of other thoughts on L2s here. But, but, but one point that I think is important to understand is L2s really, one way to think about them is that they're scaling, they are increasing the density of Ethereum layer one um, block space, right? Because in, in the analogy, which I kind of coined on this a few years ago was, imagine that right now Ethereum layer one is like the island of Manhattan, right? And imagine that it's basically just like, you've got barns built on layer one, um, right? And this is before Manhattan became like the most valuable real estate in the world, basically. Right. But you've got barns built there. Um, there's not a ton you can do when you're just all barns. Right. Um, there's not yeah. a lot of revenue that you can grow from that. There's not a lot of users you can attract. But as you start scaling up and you start building these skyscrapers and think of these L2s, each L2 is like its own skyscraper. You're allowing for a lot more transactions to take place within that same amount of block space. And I think that's, to me, that's that's something that's really exciting because as we scale that block space and as we scale the number of transactions, Ethereum and the L2s can process, we're not only going to see more users come in, but we're also going to see new kinds of applications which can be built with that block space because now you can do a lot more transactions than you could ever do before, which means you can do things like smart contract wallets. You can do more advanced DeFi apps. You can do more advanced NFT finance apps. There's just so much that's, that's possible. Yeah. I, I mean, you get hey, me excited no, Hold on it. for a second. I can't hear you. Let me, I don't know if it's a. Oh, interesting. You can't hear this now. I don't think it's you. I think it's me. Yeah, I think I'm I, I'm doing fine on my end. Yep. That's all right. We can go ahead and, and pause one second, see how everything is. I think okay. I'm all no, we're good. In. We're good. Sorry, I don't know what happened. My headset just like turned off. Oh, now we're back. Excellent. Yeah. No, I was gonna say. Uh, I love the analogy. I actually didn't even know that 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 you had coined that. So that's cool. Uh, I've heard it many times. The I think uh, you know David Hoffman has used it a, a few times here and there uh, for sure, and it makes a lot of sense. So. Uh, that is that that does get me excited. It gets me more, you know, confident, obviously, in Ethereum and and the way that it's going to scale long term. And I think it's a, an apt metaphor. I want to take a step back um, because I know that every time somebody asks you, okay, you know, what was your previous experience? You say something like, you know, I was a management consultant in the public sector. And so my question to you is, uh, did you work for the CIA? No, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> and I, I won't discuss the specific organizations I work with, but I worked uh, not only with government agencies, but also some commercial ones, also some intergovernmental agencies. Um, it kind of gave me, you know, in grad school, I studied public policy. So I was always driven by this concept of public service and um, providing public goods to people. And so that has been kind of core to my DNA in a lot of ways, but I've also also had this like business mindset. And that's kind of why I, I felt like that public sector consulting was a, was a good fit, but yeah, didn't, I didn't get to work on anything quite that exciting. <laughs> yeah. I, I was starting to have my suspicions. I really was. I was like, he, he's been always so vague and it sounds so interesting. Uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, I, I'm sure you've gotten you, you've tangentially been able to, you know, consult on some interesting things and learn a lot about the world sure. that way. That, that actually feels like it's a really, uh, you know, a, as different as it seems, the, the way that you just framed it, it makes it seem like you actually are very well suited to uh, help push forward something like Ethereum, which is almost like, you know, in a lot of ways, a public good, right? Like in the ways mm -hmm. that in the ways that it's built, do you see parallels between, you know, how, what you did before and what you're working on now? In some ways, yes, because I think that one of the things that governments try to do and increasingly, and sometimes they don't always succeed at this is, but they try to kind of maintain that legitimacy with their populations, the people that they're serving. Right. And if you talk to a lot of people who work in government, I'm not saying everyone's like a great person or employee, but a, a lot of people are truly like motivated by public service. That's part of, that's why they're working in the government, 
you know, they didn't get into it to become some evil overlord. I feel like Twitter, especially like crypto Twitter, sometimes has a warped perception of these things. Um, and I think it's like not only sometimes, it's basically always. It's like the the government <laughs> is not viewed. I don't know anyone on, on crypto Twitter that's out there other than like you have some reasonable responses, right? But like uh, most people are pretty hardcore, like not pleased with the government at this point in time. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not going to be an apologist because I, I think a lot of the problems are actually structural. It is a lot of times it's like good people sometimes trapped in bad systems. There's also limits to what they can do given, you know, government and legislative like oversight and things like that. They have to operate within certain executive and legislative yeah. frameworks so they can't just do whatever they want, even if the even what they're if what they're doing isn't necessarily the best solution. But I think that um, when I you know part of what really attracted me to Ethereum was it, I do view it kind of as much as we can as this public good, right? And I think that's what to me differentiates it from a lot of other projects in the space. So when people are like, "What about?" my in, insert my bags or my projects right <laughs> and they're like why don't you like that and it's like look you know i mean like I, and it's not necessarily saying that the team is bad but part of it is a lot of these things are structured in ways where they're designed for the token to kind of pump in value and they're not necessarily focused on achieving decentralization not today and may, maybe not ever right and i think that's part of Whereas if you look at Ethereum, like, you know, look, my background in terms of technology is I was like a young internet user in the 90s, you know, one of the first like young people who was on this consumer internet as it started to go mainstream. And that profoundly kind of shaped my experience because things were a lot more open back then. And you could tell, you could tell the thing, you could see that almost everything was like this organic thing that was growing out of nothing and became something that was attracting uh, really smart, really bright people who wanted to build things. And I and I see that like so much in the Ethereum ecosystem. I do see it in a few others too, um, potentially, but I think that they have more to prove over time, right? And if they've kind of proved that over like a couple of cycles, then we can, then I'll take it a lot more seriously and say, okay. And yeah, like maybe the alpha has gone there, but you know, my time is limited. I want to focus on things that I think are contributing to this kind of worldview of promoting decentralization, um, promoting decentralized ownership. And to me, Ethereum is one of the best blockchains to do that. with. Love it. Uh, before I, I do, I mean, we're going to spend a lot of time on NFTs, but I've got the I've got this burning question that, you know, some of the smarter people that I that I know that have been afraid that, you know, they used to just love crypto and they're just getting increasingly more and more fearful of the government um, and, yep. and regulations and all of the security FUD and all of that. Um, what's your take on, you know, how, I guess, number one, how concerned are you? And, and what do you see? How do you see this all playing out in the next few years? Because you got on the one side, people just doom and glooming saying, OK, we're literally at war and, uh, you know, the, this crypto war against, you know, government versus crypto and uh, yeah. Then you got others saying, well, they'll have some regulations, but things will be fine. You know, how do you view this and, and where do you see this all shaking out? I guess in terms of ETH in particular, since that's what, uh, you know, we're all living on these days. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is I don't know completely, but I will say that one, crypto is a global movement, right? It's not going to be defined by the laws and jurisdiction of one nation state. And if it is, we've kind of failed. Um, so, right. uh, number two, I, I have not been encouraged by us. I I've been, I've gone back and forth on us response to crypto over the past like 10 years. Right. I mean, like sometimes it seems like they're cracking down super heavy. Sometimes it seems like they're being very favorable. It seems like a lot of the current policy is being driven at the executive level and not necessarily at the legislative level. Um, and you know, executive, the executive, the presidency and so on can change a lot faster than say legislative uh, bodies might change. So right. I think that, you know, and you do see some prominent legislators who are speaking out in favor of crypto. I think that the U S like quite frankly is making a huge strategic mistake if it doesn't embrace crypto because it will be embraced by our allies and also some of our adversaries. And I think that's what makes crypto interesting as this potentially neutral settlement layer that anyone can use. I understand why a nation state like the US might be threatened by that. But I also think if you think about it, the opportunity is huge for the US to have an outsized impact within that, right? Like if the US 
issued a its own sovereign digital U.S. dollar on Ethereum or whatever, or at least allowed USDC to become that and you know stopped getting in its way, for example, um, it would be huge for entrenching the relevance of the U.S. dollar globally, as 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 we all expect more and more economy is going to be going online into this decentralized digital settlement layer. And I feel like the U.S. is making a lot of strategic mistakes around crypto. I feel like a lot of it is being driven by emotional narratives, which are not really founded in reality. I feel like the lawmakers and the policymakers are not particularly well educated on this. And I think a lot of things will come back to haunt us. That said, even if the U.S. knee jerk, like, you know, I... I, I won't say that crypto could never be banned in the US, but I kind of don't see us moving towards like a complete ban. That would be yeah. like a little over the top. I think they'll make it hostile for certain kinds of development to occur within the US. And maybe US citizens get um, get are prohibited from accessing certain kinds of a- apps or getting access to certain kinds of rewards. And I think that hurts US participants. But the show is going to go on, folks. I mean, like, you know, we're looking at a technology that has been building already for well over 10 years. And, and you know, from if you include Bitcoin and we're looking at something that's going to become profoundly important over the next 10 to 20 years. And I think the timeline for all this stuff always takes longer than people think. But I think that's the time frame that I'm looking at this stuff. And I feel like eventually the U.S. will be forced to come around and accept parts of this technology. That's encouraging to me. And I, I like the idea. It's it's that's kind of the beauty of it, right? Like it, it will move on in some form or fashion. And so uh, hopefully just those of us that live in the U.S. aren't too hindered uh, by whatever happens. And, and that's so that does give me some encouragement. OK, so I want to I want to get into 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 my favorite uh, subject, especially when it comes to you is uh, is NFTs um, <laughs> and may as well open it up with your with your gallery here. Uh, I remember, you know, in early 2021 is when I came across, uh, I think actually what, what really started to get me like, oh, something's happening is when you changed your profile pic from you as the suit to you as the punk. (laughs) And, uh, and, and, and you're, I remember you kind of explaining the idea. It was almost like you were teaching me what a profile picture was, right? Like, like what this concept of a digital identity was. Um, what, what was the moment where things like first clicked for you? Like, wow, like NFTs are going to be a big deal because somehow I saw you start doing all of this and I had a front row seat, like literally on the front row. And I, I just took me a year later to like, really be like, oh man, like all those generative art pieces, they were grails. (laughs) Like, why wasn't I picking up squiggles at 0.2 ETH, you know? And like, well, so like you were just sitting there, just you, you bought a lot in a short period of time. How did, like, where did that conviction come from? And like, what, what was it? And how, how did you develop that thesis of like, this is important and I'm going to spend some, you know, allocate some funds to this. Yeah. So um, a couple things about my personal situation at that point. So we're looking back to January 2021. And at that point, I had just left my job as a consultant, which I had been doing for 15 years. And, you know, I had at that point, I felt like I had done well enough in crypto. We were in a bull market. I wanted to be able to focus more on the space and to contribute where I could, but also to kind of pay attention to these various investment and collecting opportunities. And up before that point, NFTs were definitely on my radar, but they weren't something I was thinking about necessarily as art, right? Um, For a lot of us who were in the 2017 bull market, we our first exposure to NFTs was CryptoKitties. And um, CryptoKitties were like these collectible little on-chain cats, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with them. But the bottom line is they were, they were kind of like, they were a little bit gimmicky. They were very interesting in terms of like, you could like breed them together and create new ones. There's like well over a million CryptoKitties, I think, as a result of that. So they didn't necessarily hold on to a lot of value, but it was still something that was like interesting to me. I was like, okay, that's an interesting little collectible. And then we also saw uh, players like Fuel, now Immutable Games, create uh, Gods Unchained, which is like a um, collectible card game based on Ethereum. There was a lot of other stuff like that going on in the bear market. You saw Axie. Also parallel to all of that, kind of like below the surface to me was a lot of this art stuff was going on. 
I wasn't paying as much attention because I was so focused on like the financial side. I found the gaming part of it kind of interesting as a gamer and I, I like trading card games and I saw the value proposition of using NFTs. But when I really started, well, after I had kind of left my job in 20, January 2021, I started to look at the art side a little bit more. And I saw at that point, it was just like one or two people were using crypto punks as their avatars. And it kind of pushed me to learn more. And it was interesting to see how passionate they were about these little JPEGs. And so yeah. I was like, I was like, there's something here. And so I was hanging out in the Discord. I eventually bought one punk. Um, that quickly grew into six. Like I, and everyone, everyone there was joking because they're like, "Oh, DC, you say you're just going to buy one, but you just keep coming back and you're buying more." And I was like, "Yeah, it's addictive." And then from there, I started talking with folks in the Discord further about like, you know, what does this really mean culturally? What does this mean technologically? And that's really where I started to dive into generative art. And once I saw, and it was around the time that Ringers had just kind of dropped, so I missed the drop, but I was like, this is really interesting. I thought the artwork was fascinating. I thought the process was fascinating. I thought that this concept of long form generative art, just to me as like, it appealed to like kind of my aesthetic and emotional side, but also this logical thinking and collector side. And I was like, this seems like a match made in heaven. And I see you've got the ringers up here from my collection. And I mean, I thought it went, you know, it was kind of like, I looked at each one and I thought they were interesting little pieces of like modern art. And then as I understood, oh, each one of these was generated at the time of mint based on the transaction hash. And the artist, Dimitri Cherniak, had no control over what each output was going to look like. And there's a thousand of them. There's like a community of people who are collecting these and other generative art projects. Uh, like a light bulb kind of went off in my head. Mm. And so I started collecting a lot of ringers. I think I got, up, I don't know the exact count, but it's like over 20 ringers that I ended up accumulating pretty quickly. <laughs> Same thing with like autoglyphs. Like I kind of, once I understood the value, then I was like, okay, what was first? And uh, and actually, I, I think the first thing I bought on Artbox was actually Genesis Zero, which I think you were on um a second ago yeah so the yeah, right one here. that one right there yeah so that was kind of a fluke that i was able to buy genesis zero which was one of the day one sets um created by dan calderon and he was actually as the artist was supposed to mint zero so most zero mints are owned by the artist due to a bug in the platform or bug in terms of how they opened it up a user was able to buy this one and so i came in and kind of splashed and i was like okay i'm gonna buy it, it was on for sale for like i think 15 ETH or something like that and so I just, I was like, screw it. I'm going to buy it. This is like one of the first sets ever released on art blocks. It's called Genesis. Yeah, for- it's called Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Number Genesis. zero, you know, yeah. like in the beginning. And so I was like, I was like, if I think this stuff has value, I feel like some of this like earlier provenance stuff, which, which, you know, had, you, you know, which could become important in the future. I was like, I just got to buy it. And so, you know, I had done well from all the DeFi and crypto stuff that I had done up to that point. I was barring against my ether on like some of these decentralized lending platforms, which I don't necessarily recommend uh, doing a ton of, but you know, that's how I financed all this. And I was just like, I, I didn't want to lose my ETH exposure, but I wanted to get exposure to all of the stuff that was going on. And as you can see, I got a little uh, out of control. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I mean, out of control might be one word. It's uh, you just could say, you know, uh, like a profit for very prescient uh, and and being able to see kind of the value here. I mean, here's the moose, the glorious moose we see here <laughs> of the ringers. And I, you know, I, I, I've shared this a million times, but your, you know, it was the, my, I have one ringer and I got it for four ETH. It was one of my very first purchases. Nice. And it was, it was based, I mean, it was after watching you uh, go through that, you know, that, that whole experience and what I think is so beautiful about Ringers is, is just that it's it's such a great commentary and like an educative uh, set, like series to teach you what generative art is like. And I think it just does such a good job of that, that mm-hmm. I always like to use Ringers as an example to teach people about generative art uh, because it's so simple and clean. And like some people, you know, like some people will, will be like, oh, this is just so simple. But like. I don't know. Like I, 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 I sometimes push back a little bit when people love Fidenza so much because I'm like, look, Fidenza is obviously grail. They're beautiful, but like you can spot a ringer from a mile away 
and they are so simple and so clean that then sometimes the Fidenza and these other, you know, a lot of other things, they get really busy and you're just like, you're, what am I looking at here? I got to zoom in to like appreciate it. And a ringer, man, it's just is so right there, clean in your face. And I, I, I feel like it's hard to beat a set of ringers, you know, from a, putting them in a, mm -hmm. in a museum or something. It's like a set of ringers are just, I don't know, man, there's something special about them. Yeah, I, 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 of course, agree with you. And I think, you know, part of the reason why they kind of captured my imagination was it allowed me to kind of see this procedural element of it a little bit more directly because it is. So if you look at these ringers, they're basically just strings wrapped around pegs with various characteristics and fills and colors and stuff like that. And, you know, what Dimitri did as an artist was he had to kind of select those parameters very carefully. He had to generate the probabilities of them showing and it's, it was hard. It's, I, I imagine it was hard for him as an artist to make some of those really curatorial editorial decisions because, um, you know, I think one of the things that ringers did that generative art sets today don't do is ringers was afraid to have like some duds, if you will. Right? Ringer, like there are definitely some ringers that are like, well, that one on its own looks kind of janky. Right. But then you kind of put them together into, uh, you know, and Dimitri created them to be displayed as grids, by the way. Right. That was his intent, yeah. which was more accessible back in the early days. Now it's not quite as easy to assemble a grid. I yeah. don't know what the floor price on these things is, but it's probably like at least 50 ether or something like that. And so it became so it became something that was more difficult to display as a grid, but that was always Dimitri's vision. I also think what's really interesting to me about ringers is a lot of them have like this anthropomorphic or zoomorphic like quality to them which i think just makes it like really interesting like the one you've got at the bottom here i think that's ringer number one or two or something like that uh the one to the left of that which one is that the squid looking one. oh yeah three three so i always felt like this one looked like the a squid or like the alien from like stranger things or something like that right the ringer to the left of that one is actually uh one of the ones that i got um What's the number on that one? 104. 104. Um, that's probably my favorite ringer, not just that I own, but like in the entire set, probably. Nice. Um, it just has like this movement and dynamism. It feels like it feels like all of these like men at work on top of each other all jumbled up, you know. I mean, it just conveys like this energy. And this is the one one of the ones that I got that I ordered from Dimitri and kind of have it displayed prominently in my home, but yeah, just aesthetically, the set really spoke to me. And, you know, the fact that other people are like, this is stupid or like whatever, kind of made it made it more attractive to me because yeah. I feel like a good art sometimes has to be a little bit polarizing yeah. and it doesn't offend me. It's just like, OK, you know, you don't have the same taste as me. But I think what if you ask Dimitri, he'll tell you, he's like, look, we didn't he didn't design Ringer so that every mint was going to be a banger. He designed it so that, you know, it was kind of telling a story through all these disparate, disparate pieces. And I feel like the trend in generative art since then has now been, well, we need every piece to be a banger. It's got to look good because if you're only minting one, um, you know, you no one wants to get a bad mint, so to speak. And so I feel like Ringers in a lot of way took some creative chances that would not be as popular today. And in a lot of ways, that makes it like more valuable and compelling to me. Interesting. I like those thoughts. And it also, I mean, the reality too, though, is even if, even if some of them are a little bit like, you know, quote unquote lame or more of a dud, the fact remains that the beauty of the set is that like you instantly still know that it's a ringer, right? Like there's no, mm -hmm. there's no errors in such a way that you're like, this doesn't even look like it belongs to this, you know, to this collection. Right. And that's right. where the magic I think happens with so many of these is like, they're able to keep keep the continuity and the the themes to uh, very clear, um, even if you know it may not be as exciting, right? So one of the things that I said about Ringer about my collection of Ringers, which don't get me wrong, I'm really glad to have the Ringers that I have. Um, but I feel like when I was buying them, I was kind of I was trying to kind of arrange and display as as I went. Um, but I was kind of looking mostly just to buy like single Ringers that looked like really good on their own. If you and I kind of wish I had like, you know, I, I think a person who has a better ringers collection than me is JDH. And I really just think that, you know, he has more of the range of outputs uh, reflected yeah. in his collection. And I think that is, so that's, I just think that's interesting from a collector point of view and kind of wish I had gotten a few more of those when I could have.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it, there's always there's always like these levels, right? Of like how what you wish you had more of in terms of the the, the collection. And yeah, I find myself wanting to own like three of something, right? Uh, and having mm -hmm. a nice little triptych of whatever it may be. Um, you know, I'm just scrolling down here. We've got the Rapture. I mean, another uh, really cool, uh, you know, project by Dimitri. Uh, we've got the Dead Ringers, which I have hanging in my house. Uh, one of the signed prints is it's just awesome. It fits perfectly. Uh, I think this is my favorite. It wasn't technically an open edition, but it was, you know, effectively an open edition. It's still <laughs> my favorite one to date, you know? Don't tell Dimitri it was open edition. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> it was 10 to the fourth power or something, right? And, uh, and, but, but even still, I mean, it was a phenomenal project, looked so good. And, you know, money went to a good cause and all of that. So it was cool to see that he didn't uh, try and, like, you know, just take crazy advantage, um, uh, you, you know, he, and, and this is well before the open edition meta. Um, so you, uh, you kind of early on in 2021, I feel like throughout 2021, you were making a lot of buys mm -hmm. and then that has since slowed. I mean, I haven't been tracking you as hawkishly lately, but that I feel like you've gotten much more picky. Uh, how has your kind of thesis around collecting changed if at all? And, you know, what are you, you know, what, why did you slow down? Was it just, you know, obviously the, the historic piece was, was, was gone and the prices were up or tell me more about how your kind of collecting journey has evolved from 2021 till today. Well, I mean, one of the things which if anyone looks at my wallet, they'll see that I don't really sell the nfts that i buy so eventually i almost called this episode why dc never sells but i <laughs> i didn't <laughs> well that's it's a good question regardless and i think so a couple of things one i really feel like a lot of the things that i bought are like these historic um artworks artifacts these are going to be like time capsules of a time period which was very important for us as a species that's how i think about um, these early NFTs, quite frankly, which might sound a little hyperbolic to some people, but that's honestly how I think about it. Um, I really don't want to sell like autoglyphs right now, unless I really need the money, you know, like yeah. if I really needed the money, I would sell them, but like, I'm not trying to sell this stuff if I don't have to, um, like, and I, and I have committed to myself, like, okay, during the next bull market, maybe we sell like five or 10% of like what we have just to be a little bit more liquid and, but it'll just give me more confidence and leeway to hold onto the rest. Right. I think wow. some of these things are going to become priceless in ways that will become very hard for like your average person to even conceptualize the value of. Um, and I, there are a lot of reasons why I feel that way, but I feel like this is the unique moment in time where our lives have already gone profoundly digital. And now we have a way to assign ownership within those digital lives. And as we do more and more stuff online, you know, if this, if this VR, AR metaverse takes off, um, all of those dynamics, I think, lend themselves to some of these early digital assets becoming more valuable. So one, I don't necessarily see a better place to like allocate my money, quite frankly. You know what I mean? Like if I sell Autoglyph, what am I going to buy? Like, do I want to go buy? Like, I mean, yeah, I could trade. I could be like, all right, I sell an autoglyph for like 500K and I go sweep the floor of some PFP collection. And, you know, I it just doesn't appeal to me, to be honest, right? Everything I bought here is, almost everything I bought here is like artwork that I think is genuinely interesting to me. And I find aesthetically interesting. I find the story interesting. I find the creators interesting. I find the provenance interesting. And that that value doesn't decrease with time it increases so if anything my conviction goes up and i don't want I, there's even less desire for me to sell and flip into something new so if i had infinite funds um i would just keep buying there's a lot of stuff i would buy quite frankly i mean i recently i haven't even added them to my gallery yet but i recently just bought a bunch of anti cyclones um by william mapon and that's a collection i've been watching for a while and i've been watching william and his work for a while and he, he seems like someone who is going to be one of these key figures in this movement that other artists are looking up to. And I was like, I want to own some of his first significant work on Ethereum. And so I, I was going to get three, but then I saw like six of them look really good. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to sweep. We're just going to get it done. <laughs> Add it to the vault. <laughs> oh, it was so brutal because uh, I, uh, 
I have been looking at anti-cyclones as well. And I had, I had a kind of a greedy, you know, collection offering cause I wanted one mm. and I, I started doing it more right when he released strands of solitude. Cause all of the attention was on that drop and everybody was loving it. And so I was like, Hey, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to zig when everyone zags. I just started putting in collection offers, but I was too greedy and I never got it. And then you <laughs> came in and swept six. I at least feel good about the fact I was onto something, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I was like, Oh mother, like he came in and you know, the floor immediately, you know, went from like six to 10 and it, like they can do that with such smaller collections like that. But I really, I really, it, it feels to me like William has the respect of, all the collectors and especially other generative artists. Like I, I can't remember. It may have been Dimitri. Don't quote me. Sorry if I'm wrong, Dimitri, but it, it may have been Dimitri or some other very well-known generative artist that basically said, you know, just chatted with William can confirm he's nicer and smarter than all the rest of us kind of a thing, you know, mm -hmm. and so when other artists and a lot of collectors are saying like, man, this is a guy to watch probably something to pay attention to. I, I would guess. Yeah. And part of it, and definitely those things kind of enter into my own calculus as well, but you know, it was kind of with his second set strands of solitude, at least the second Ethereum set, I know he has some stuff on other chains as well, but like it was with that, that I was like, okay, this is someone who is going to keep creating at a very high level. This is someone who is dedicated to the space and it, you know, and I, I think, you know, node, but maybe I'm sure some of your listeners probably also gather that I, I, I don't, I'm not like trying to move like fast all the time. Right now. I know that that's somewhat contrary to the conversation we just had of how did I end up with all these NFTs back in early 2021? What I'll say there is I saw, I was obvious to me that we were in a very unique point in time, one yes. that would last for like a couple of months at most. And I was like, I got to load up. I was like, I'm not messing around. And maybe I was already primed for that because I'd been through um, a cycle on Ethereum and because I had just gotten through all this DeFi insanity, but I was like, I'm not missing this. Right. And so I set aside a certain amount of money that I was like, I'm willing to lose this. Right. If it doesn't work out, it's not going to like bankrupt me. I won't be happy, but it's yeah. like, I'm not going to like, you know, be kicked out of my house or apartment or whatever. And so I was like, I've got to take a chance here because I, I see value in this digital culture that is being created here. And I wanted to own as much of it as I could. That's yeah, that is, I, I, I feel like exactly you, 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 you saw that moment in time and you took advantage of it. But since then, I mean, you've never, I've never seen you act on an impulse, right? It's kind of like, I feel like you're more like, it's like your apple. It's like you're waiting until you know, you've got it right. And then you, you strike, right. And you get what you want. And uh, you've done that with a few collections. I, I know like like Memories of Chi Lin, I bring it up every episode because it's my favorite collection. Like you came in and swept those a little bit later, you know, like uh, it, it wasn't later, but it was like they were, at, they it wasn't right after Mint, right? And they were at like one point something and you grabbed a bunch more then. And then, yeah. you know, I, it was, that was around the time that I finally picked one up and then I've gotten another one since. But uh, it does feel like you, you, you somehow are able to like, not get caught up in the FOMO and like, you know, I, how do you do that? I guess is, is my question because almost mm. all of these sets, you know, like they've, they've like anti-cyclones were up at like 12 ETH at one point. Right. And then, you know, I, I, do you just kind of have that confidence? You're like, yeah, you know what? Like they skyrocketed at first, but like, I'm going to wait and see. And I feel like they'll settle back down. And sure enough, like you caught them at a perfect local low again. How do you like manage these expectations of, okay, I'm not going to get caught up in the hype and two, but two, like, I mean, am I ever going to see this price again? Kind of a mentality. Right. How do you kind of, kind of think through that? So I don't like to, I definitely don't like to FOMO. Right. I mean, and, and that doesn't mean I'm immune to it. I've definitely, I'm not going to feel like you me. are, if anyone is, it's DC. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're the well, only one I know. Yeah. I'm not totally immune to it, but I try to like keep it in check. Right. And part of how do I do that? I think that actually just going back to what we talked about a second ago, which is I don't really sell stuff. Right. So when you're not really selling stuff, you can't really afford to like FOMO all the <laughs> time. Good point. And I've actually like, I credit a lot of my, um, you know, success and unrealized gains, let's say to, to, because I forced myself to say, okay, if I buy this, I might never sell this. Or if I sell it, it might not be for years or decades. Right. And like, what am I willing to hold over that time? And it's not the hot PFP drop of the week. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not like, I'm not that interested in like 
and, and, and like how much money materially do I want to put into something like that anyway, right? And I, know, I get that there's traders out there and I leave those things to them, right? I'm not trying to be a trader. I don't, I, I'm lazy, node. okay? I don't want to go. <laughs> Honestly, I am. I don't want to be like on my wallet at 3 a.m. trying to figure out, oh, do I need to unload this now? Like, I, I, I don't care. I don't want to do that. And I honestly think like it's really hard for people to be good traders and good long-term investors and collectors. This is what this is just my observation, right? And everybody, I get it. Everybody wants to trade up and build up to getting more capital so they can do bigger things and so on. But I've never been a trader, right? I mean, like I've never, I've never like very rare. If I sell a position in the same day, like for fungible tokens, it's because I feel like I made a mistake in buying. I'm not trying to catch like a quick, like one or 2% gain, right? It's because it's like, okay, I, I, I kind of got a little emotional with this decision and I'm going to back out. So with NFTs, part of the unique thing is like, it's all visible to the outside world, right? And I don't have any other NFT wallets. My public NFT wallet is my wallet, right? I'm not like trading on the back end because I don't, I, again, I don't care. Right? It's just like, if I want to trade something, I'd rather just trade fungible tokens because they're a lot easier to move um liquid. yeah it, yeah i mean now nft market has more inefficiencies in it and that's why some traders can do really well so there is money to be made there and i'm not against trading i think that like you know look if you're if you're bringing liquidity to the market then that's that is a value add in this market right i've bought from a lot of traders and i always say if you sell me something i'm sorry you know, it's just like, because <laughs> now it's not moving anywhere for a long time and I'm just hanging on to it. So I think, but but to answer your question, like if you think long-term, you're automatically going to cut out like 95% of what's going on in, the, in this space. Yeah, I love that. The the, the very idea of, be, of, of saying like, I do not plan on selling this will make you think twice uh, about purchasing, which is, which is a really, really good point. It's like so simple yet so profound and would, would impact uh, so many people's buying decisions, right? If they were to think in that way. So how do you, uh, I want to know like how you um, make your buying decisions now, um, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to, to, to NFTs, you know, what are you, what are you looking for uh, in it when you make, before you make a purchase? So I definitely buy like a lot less at this point, right? And again, most of that is just a limitation of I don't have infinite capital. But I did commit to myself during this bear market that there were going to be some things that I really wanted to get exposure to that I wasn't able to earlier. And I've also felt like we're probably overhyped with a lot of like trader types who piled in who wanted to seek an exit at some point, right? So I wait for those folks to kind of exit. Right. And when I start seeing people like selling things, especially at like 50% losses, 80% losses, that's where I realize, okay, those people are almost completely flushed out of the market and, and OpenSea and other trading apps make it really easy to see that. So I'm like, okay, I'm ready to move now. Um, but I really am looking, my, what I collect has not really changed. I look for these artists and these works that I think are kind of changing the game, changing the culture. And, um, and I think, you know, things that I think are going to age like fine wines rather than, you know, trying to get a quick harvest after a year. And behind almost all of the collections that I collect, there's an interesting story there. And there's an interest, there's an even more interesting story in my head of like, where is this going to sit like 10 years from now or 20 years from now? And, you know, I said on my feed not that long ago, look, I wasn't like some kind of art historian before I got into this, right? I like art. I mean, I've always enjoyed art. I think I have a decent eye for aesthetics and it's something that I really have always appreciated. Um, I really appreciate like beautiful things. I appreciate a creative process, but I'm not some like art history aficionado who knows everything that's ever happened. You know, I was an art history major in college. And so for me, I operate a lot on instinct and thinking about more, less on like, well, what does this academically mean? Right. Like, I mean, like, for example, like there's a lot, there's some people who like get tripped up on the fact it's like, well, Tyler Hobbs wasn't the first person to do a flow field algorithm on, um, on, uh, on generative art. And it's like, okay. But he was like the first person to do a long form generative art collection using this flow field algorithm with the color palette and like all of these, like, parametric decisions that he just nailed and created this beautiful set. 
And whether he was the first person to use that technique or not, he is one of the people who's done it best. And he was the first person to do it in a long form generative art collection, which is like, you know, now what we're all collecting because the other stuff wasn't collectible in the same way. And I think that like people really, some of the like art curatorial people trip themselves up the worst um, from what I've seen. And they get angry because they're like, this shouldn't be worth anything. The dentist should go to zero. And I'm like, you guys don't understand. It's not just about like an art technique. It's about the cultural relevance of this, right? And Fidenzas and Ringers and some of these other sets are now etched into the history of like, into into crypto history, into NFT history. And that is not going to become less important over time. It's going to become more important over time. And it, it sometimes I just, I don't get how people don't see that. Yeah, yeah, I I, I totally get you. I, I sometimes have little, little uh, mini arguments on Twitter with people when they start, trying to shill their historical bags right and it's like the reality is is like the the history that's been that's being written is being written in the and like the market kind of tells you uh you know what what they're valuing and and yeah certain things can be mispriced but always kind of bothers me when people try like to really go after some of these like timeline things and get really nitpicky and they're like well this was this was technically before this and i'm like yeah but nobody nobody cared and it, it didn't look good and nobody loved it then and they don't love it now. Um, but like, but ends is they love. Right. And like, right. so I, I think the market is, is, has kind of already started to tell us, you know, what, uh, w- what people are valuing from a historic and even just from a, you know, a, an artistic uh, perspective. For sure. And I think that that doesn't mean that some of the earlier stuff won't gain in value, but a lot of these things weren't culturally relevant then, and they're not culturally relevant now. And I think that if people don't understand that, cultural relevance is actually what's driving the valuation of this stuff. And I don't know what to tell them. And I don't think that can be totally divorced from like, whether that's ingenuity or aesthetic quality or a story. Right. And I think the story is like, I keep going back to that, but I think like, like if there, if I can't under it, like sometimes there is a story and I just can't see it. Right. Or I don't know it, but over time as I learn it or as it is revealed to me, I'm like, okay, I understand now and I need to get some of this. And sometimes the story changes on stuff too that you've bought. And it's just like, well, you know, we'll see how it evolves from here. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Mebits uh, was a story that changed on us. Just to touch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know you've got a bunch of those, uh, not exactly like fine art, but you know, still we, we were all thinking it was going to be something very different and, uh, you know, uh, things, things changed for us there. That is for sure. Um, I want to learn a little bit about what you think, um, you know, we've kind of talked about your, your past a little bit and how you view things, how you collect now. And so now I'm really curious as to your thoughts on the future. Uh, so the future of, uh, well, let's just start with, with NFTs and with generative art in particular. One, one thing that I'm starting to try and wrap my head around is like there, we're getting flooded with generative art, you know, across multiple platforms now and multiple blockchains and there's a lot of it's really good and i like it um but it's making it like impossible for me to decide like what to buy and you know what i can afford and um like how do you view the i let's start with generative art how do you view kind of this industry playing out over time and does ai art you know does that affect it or does all kind of turn into the same thing I think there's a lot of similarities and overlap probably between generative and AI art. And I think I was thinking to myself earlier today about we're not too far off from a point where artists and or read coders are going to be creating AIs, which like are art focused and maybe, and maybe they're putting, that's like their, their creation. And that AI is going to now create the art in a way that's kind of like generative artists created today where yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of through the hands-off process, if you will, once once the algorithm's out there. So eventually, we're going to see stuff like that. But I think, you know, one of the uh, one of the in- most interesting arguments people had with me back in early 2021 about generative art was, well, there's going to be so much of it. Why would it be valuable? And I I always thought that was like a funny argument because it's like, well, of course, like 99% of it is not going to be valuable, right? And I think like anyone who participates in the space should understand that, right? Like not everything is going to be valuable. Not everything has an interesting story. Not everything is culturally relevant and significant, but it's stupid to say like, well, nothing will be valuable. I mean, like, cause I mean, and this, maybe it's just my experience in 
collecting other types of things um, and looking at collectibles markets, but there's always going to be some set of things that are valuable. And if there's a lot of it, that means that overall the concept is kind of being validated. People like it. People want, want it. Um, there has been, we have had points where there was like a glut in supply and the market was not very sophisticated. And I think we saw that like there was a generative art, like boom and bust. I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was like in 2021, after all this stuff blew up, I had stopped buying at that point. I was like, I can't afford to buy at this level, you know? And I just yeah. kind of let things come back down to reality after that. A lot of sets got swept up in that. A lot of sets got their value. A lot of good stuff got ahead of their valuation probably at the time and then eventually dumped. And so for me, I, I view those as like buying and collecting opportunities where, you know, when everything, when everything indiscriminately crashes, that's an opportunity to go like diamond hunting, you know, and you can yeah. really look for those gems. And there were a few things like memories that got swept up in that, which I felt like this, these are some gems, you know, that I felt like I should go back and get like archetypes or another one that I felt like, you know, again, it just, it, things just got heated in that overall market dynamic and then came back to reality. So I feel like, you know, I don't know if I'm like the only person who thinks about the market like that. Sometimes I feel like I am, but I feel like a lot of people just have like this totally incorrect perception of like, oh, just because there's a lot, it, it's all going to zero. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, no, that, 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 <laughs> That, that totally makes sense. It's like, yeah, there's a lot. That means it's popular. You know, that's good. And so just the discerning uh, which will be valuable is obviously the uh, the whole catch. And, and hopefully, you know, other than that, just buying what you truly enjoy. So uh, that's an interesting thought of like, you know, I feel like Botto, if you've heard of Botto, right? Like that, it feels like that's like a decentralized AI that's creating art or something. Like there are some interesting things moving in that direction. Um, do you see like generative artists continuing to just, you know, creating and, and this to continue like art blocks going to continue to be big or do you see like a little bit of a slowdown? Do you see AI taking, you know, like AI is hot right now. Um, do you feel like these are in competition at all or just kind of, yeah. What are your thoughts there? I don't necessarily view it as a competition, but at any given time, perhaps there's like a scarce amount of attention in the ecosystem. And so it kind of shifts around, but part of what I think we're doing is we're growing the ecosystem. And so we still have a relatively small number of participants. And I think AI art is going to be part of that story. I also think generative art, but I think if anything is it succeeds, it brings kind of more attention to generative art, which, you know, mm -hmm. depending on how you look at it, um, require, I don't want to say it requires higher skill, but it requires a different kind of skill, right? Which is not necessarily as accessible and I think that I think what's going to become more important for a lot of artists, especially in the AI world, is people are going to be interested in the process. Um, people are going to be interested in your process as a creator. Um, collectors mm -hmm. will want to know how certain things are created. And I think with generative art, um, and there are parts of that that can be generated through like AI. Uh, you know, I've been going on an AI rant on Twitter lately because I'm just, it's blowing my mind, but like there's code, like there is generative art code that you can write through an AI. But I think like the really good generative artists are going to, you know, they just painstakingly tweak the hell out of these parameters before they launch. I mean, it is a nerve wracking process for them. I think that there are some AI artists who are at that level, right? Like Claire Silver is kind of at that level where she will like painstakingly do stuff. There's also some really like lazy AI artists who are not really, engaging at that level. And I think it kind of, it kind of shows, you know, I mean, like, I think it shows in like their, in their work and in their public reception. And so, but my point is, I think people are going to want to understand that process. And I think with generative art, the process is like super interesting. And it's actually, it's also somewhat more transparent than AI art right now. So I think that's actually like a tailwind for generative art longer term. Interesting. I like that. You know, that's a, uh, yeah, because everything's transparent when it comes to generative art, right? Like the code is on there, <laughs> you know, that's it's, you can see it and, and they, the artist either created that code or they didn't. So as long as they're not uh, false, you know, like hiring somebody else that's, that, that's done it for them, right? Like uh, it is very, uh, you know, cut and dry and kind of very pure and authentic. And that's where I feel like it has such a great use case when it comes to blockchain tech. Because once that once that algorithm's uploaded, you know, and it, like once it's there, uh, they it's there, right? And like we're minting, and like they don't they don't get to change things after that, uh, the on chain stuff. And so I really like uh, that 
component of it. It feels like it's just this really ideal match made uh, between, you know, art and blockchain tech, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's actually like the, I think in some ways, and it's, I've thought about it a lot. I can't really think of another art form on chain, which makes better use. I can't even conceptualize an yeah. artwork that makes better use of the inherent properties of public blockchains than generative art, which is why my collection is so heavily weighted. And, and you know, part of a lot of people ask me, well, why aren't you collecting this? Why aren't you collecting that? It's like, I, I have little pieces of everything. Like I've got some AI art, I have some photography, but I'm not necessarily trying to like collect everything. Right. I mean, like the way I describe it is like, if I wanted to have my humble little collection be like a museum, it would be more like the Musée d'Orsay than the Louvre. Right. It's like, yeah. I want to have something that's more thematically focused with a few like comparative oddities with the rest of my collection within that, that I feel like are really important and interesting, but I'm not going to be able to collect like everything anyway. You know, so I'd rather just have a make a statement. And, and my highest conviction, quite frankly, remains in this on chain generative art. Well, wow, I love and I think there's a I mean, that's a beautiful lesson to be learned, right? Is like you have you've been able to make that like that decision uh, very clearly of like, this is what I like. This is what I want to focus on. This is what feels like it has value. And you continue to focus on, um, you know, and collect what you what you have the bandwidth to collect. Uh, whereas, you know, meanwhile, the rest of us, like, dude, the last bull run, I was doing everything. Like there wasn't anything that I didn't try and, and <laughs> buy, you know what I mean? I'm like, I bought generative art. And then all of a sudden I find myself like bridging to harmony to play DeFi kingdoms. And then I bridge to avalanche to play DeFi kingdoms. <laughs> I didn't even care, you know? And I'm like, I'm like trying to figure out this game and then I'm buying, you know, like getting swept up in the PFP mania. And like, I, I had to learn all these lessons the hard way of like, you can't be everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. And especially in a bull market, it is just uh, an, uh, like a recipe for disaster. Um, I know we're coming up on time. So I want to get I want to get into some final questions here. Yeah, uh, and 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 so zooming out a little bit, you know, we we uh, I love to look at the cycles. I had Ledger status on the show uh, last week and I was asking him about this. But how are how are you viewing um, the cyclical nature of crypto? And like if you, you know. As as close as you're as you're willing to kind of estimate, you know, where are we in this in this cycle in the bear market? How deep are we? If you if someone had to had to say like, you know, when's the when's the bull gonna come back around? You know, uh, yeah. what kind of time frame are you putting in your own mind? So I think um, knock on wood here, right? But I think like we've probably seen the absolute worst of this bear market is my hypothesis at this point. We've had basically every amount of bad news you can possibly imagine <laughs> over the past, like whatever it has been, like six months, right? It's been yeah. hell. And um, anyone who is still left. So the way I look at it, I really look at the market as like an emotional process. And this is this has been my thinking has evolved into this over time. Mm. The market is an emotional process, and, yeah. which happens to allocate capital. And I feel like a lot of um, weak hands have been shaken out through all this, right? And we've seen it on Twitter for those of us who are still left. Um, yeah. We've seen a lot of people get flushed out of the market. And and I think we've seen a healthy consolidation. You know, we saw some some entities get wiped out that absolutely needed to get wiped out. And fortunately, I mean, I, I feel bad for anybody who lost money in something like FTX, but SBF was not a good actor, you know, and he needed to be removed and I know it wasn't apparent to everybody, but I mean, like, you know, it's well, the space is better off now that someone like that is gone. We've gone through round after round of regulatory FUD, and we're still like kind of moving into like local highs today. Uh, so it's kind of like, how much worse can it get? I think also like cyclically speaking, so I really do think of markets as like um, very cyclical in a lot of ways. That doesn't mean fundamentals don't matter, but it means that within any given like trend, cyclicality, you have to examine cyclicality as part of it. And when you've seen the kind of sharp sell-offs that we've seen, like at some, sometimes there's no way to go but up, right? And I feel like right now we could be in one of, you know, again, knock on wood, I'm bullish right now, right? I mean, like I'm bullish since like the turn of the new year where I was like, okay, I need, it's time for me to get back into position on some of these things a little bit more aggressively. Um, because I felt like I didn't want to play the game of like trying to catch the bottom, right? When I saw all this stuff go down, I was like, I'm not trying to catch the bottom of the 3AC dump. I'm not trying to catch the bottom of the FTX dump. 
more power to those people who are doing that. Right. But I was like, I went pretty heavily into Ethereum between like 1200 and 1400. And I feel pretty comfortable in those positions and I'm, I'm holding on to them. So I think that over the course of the next several months, if I just had to guess gun to head, I think we're probably going to remain bullish. There is this tricky macro backdrop, which we can talk about, but um, I feel like crypto is also kind of its own thing in some ways. And so um, as we move up, if we move up, we'll probably see another severe correction this year. I think it'll be bad. I think it'll be enough to panic like any weekends that are left yeah. and they will sell everything and, you know, we'll buy it again. And, and, the, and then we're, and then we just go back to like practically up only because I feel like there's the tech, the value proposition of the technology to me has not changed. Right. It's just, we need to distribute the tokens to the people who are going to hold them for a longer term. And that's really how I view this. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, so one more, you know, just a few more liquidations then up only, you know, what I mean? <laughs> something like that, <laughs> as, <laughs> something like that. As the old saying goes, <laughs> uh, but I think that's, that's, that's wise advice and, and, and a great way to look at it. Um, okay. So my final question I like to ask a lot of my guests is, is, you know, the, just the very generic kind of advice, uh, you know, the things that, that you wish that you had known when you first got in, what advice would you give to, you know, somebody that's just popping in or even just like struggling to, try and figure out a way to like make decisions in the space. Um, what, what, what would you like to leave people with from, uh, from, you know, your own thoughts? I think uh, one, you're never going to have a hundred, hundred percent confidence in your decision-making and um, cause it's not possible. Right. So the best way to manage it is to manage your risk. Right. And I think mm -hmm. the, the most important advice I can give people is don't over invest in the space because that's where, I mean, my timeline is just filled with emotional train wrecks. My replies are filled with like, why is, did ETH go up today? Why did it go down? It's like, dude, relax. You know, like it's, if you're this caught up in like a day-to-day -day price move or like a news announcement, then you're probably over-invested. And you know what people like that do? They sell at like the bottom and they're selling to people like me, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and you don't want to do that. Right. You don't want to sell stuff to me, to be honest. But like, I mean, I'm just saying like in general, like it's all about risk management, because if you can't man and that risk tolerance looks different for every single individual. Um, so there's no one size fits all. Right. I might be comfortable with like taking much bigger risks than some people, but I'm not. There's no morning where I wake up. It's like the, where I say, am I going to have to sell everything today? Um, because I'm panicked or do I need to FOMO in everything I have today? because I I'm missing out, you know? And I think that's, but I think that's how I would say probably 80% of the market behaves. Right. And so until you can master your emotions, you're not going to be successful. That's like, you have to figure that out. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing is you have to understand that I feel like some people get very emotional about whatever they buy and they want to force, they want to create the market. They want to force people to think a certain way. I've never been like that. Like even like with generative art, I've been a loud proponent of generative art. I've been a proponent of my thesis, but I've never like tried to like shape the market with my buys and say, this is good yeah. and everything else is bad. I think people who do that end up screwing themselves over. And they're around, you know, like you can see them. They're like, they do well for a week and then it's like they sell or they it goes to zero and they're like, oh crap, you know? And so you've got to be humble as a market participant, no matter what size you're operating at. And maybe I'm operating a bigger size than you. I'm operating a smaller size than a lot of people, but you've got to be humble about your position in the market. And as long as you view it as, okay, I'm not setting the narrative. I'm observing these fundamentals and these narratives. What makes sense for me? You know, how do I want to engage and play in the space? What is my timeline? I think that's the other thing that a lot of people mess up is they just mess up their timelines. They're all like, there's a lot of people that are focused on like, say they're focused on long-term, but then they sell after a week because it doesn't go up. You know, it's just like, you're not long-term. And so I feel like if, but if people, it all comes back to that risk and portfolio allocation. And if people can get that right, then the rest of it tends to flow a lot more easily. I love that. Yeah. The, the managing risk part and the emotional part, uh, like we, we all kind of learn that the hard way. Uh, if, if you don't, if you, if you're not actually taught from somebody else. And I think that's just such good advice. Uh, because you really, without managing your risk properly, you just make terrible decisions as well. So that's mm -hmm. like where I think it all starts. 
this has been a, an incredible episode, uh, DC. I appreciate your time. We've gone over just slightly. I, I told you we probably would. I was like, there's no way I'm going to let you get away with like a 40 minute episode. You know, All like good. it's just it's just not happening. Uh, any final any final thoughts or anything that anything else you want to you want to share with people uh, in terms of, you know, what you're up to, where they can find you or any any last kind of final words? Yeah, you can find the best place to find me is on Twitter at I am DC Investor is my handle there. And, you know, part of what I've been talking about a lot lately is AI. And I really encourage anybody listening to this to dive in and start playing around with those tools, um, especially like chat GPT-4 is like a huge advancement to the point where um, I'm kind of obsessed with it right now. And, you know, use it as a tool for learning, use it as a tool to advance your own critical thinking skills. Like, so you're relevant in the next 10 years. How else, how can I put it more nicely than that? But it's like, you've got to learn how to use these tools um, really before others do, because this is, this is all a game changer. Um, and it's as big, a big game changer, I think, as crypto is. Wow. Yeah, that is uh, excellent advice. Uh, definitely something to, to think about. I've been using ChatGPT more more often myself, and it's like, yeah, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. So, uh, man, what an incredible episode. Thank you so much, DC, for joining. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Another episode of Node Mode in the books. Uh, we will catch you guys next week. Thanks again.